morning, and welcome to worship here at the Clarence Presbyterian Church. A warm welcome to all of you here in the sanctuary and those watching online. Uh, a, a reminder that uh, the restrooms are to your rear, down the hall, to my right. There's an emergency exit to my right here at the front. There's also an exit to the rear of the sanctuary. There are a number of important announcements in the bulletin. I uh, particularly want to highlight a few of them. Uh, one is the fact that Wellspring will be having its final meeting this Tuesday. The Ride for Roswell, Ride Your Own Way, uh, that was scheduled a week or so ago, has been rescheduled now for July 23rd. Details are in the bulletin. And a new group that we have called the Sociables have reserved seats for a Bisons game on July 30th. You can sign up in the Narthex. This morning we are welcoming... Reverend Dr. Thomas Yorkey to lead us in worship. Uh, Tom has uh, uh, served in a number of capacities within and without our Presbytery and our denomination. He was past a, an associate pastor at North Presbyterian Church in Williamsville. He served at College Hill Presbyterian Church in Easton, Pennsylvania, and most recently as the senior pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Buffalo. He's educated at Muskingum College in Ohio, attended the Yale Divinity School, and uh, obtained a PhD at Drew University. And he enjoys reading and writing poetry, riding his road bike with his sons, hiking with his wife, and raising their new Labrador. <laughs> God says, whoops, <laughs> sorry about that. I don't know if we can dial that down. Um, that is way too loud. Uh, how's this? Is this better? That's a little better. So let us uh, prepare our hearts and minds now for the call to worship. God says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Will you please rise? The first hymn is number 14. Number 14, for the beauty of the earth.
God of the covenant, in your baptism, you called us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us courage in this hour, and as we go about the week to come, like you gave the apostles, that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, in whom we trust. And so come humbly now to make our prayer of confession. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ. Amen. the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you that in the love of God we are a forgiven people. Let us therefore live as God's new people. Alleluia. forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Try this one more time. It is now time for the children's story. Boys and girls, if, uh, if you'd like to hear a really cool story, come on up. <laughs> Boy, yeah, have a, have a seat right here on the steps. Is that where you usually sit? Okay, great. Good. Hi. Did you uh, remember that they used to say Jesus was a fisherman, right? You remember hearing that? And what did he teach people to fish for? Do you remember that? Not for fish. Honesty, yep, for honesty. And he said to his disciples once, he said, I'll teach you to fish for people. 
honest people. Well, maybe they won't be honest when you first find them, but we'll make them honest. And, and before he could teach his disciples how to follow him, how to be honest people, he had to teach them how to be honest people, how to be faithful disciples. And so he preached something called the Sermon on the Mount. See, that's, that's, and the Sermon on the Mount was his fishing rod. Okay, when he went out to catch followers of Jesus, his followers, or send the disciples out to catch them, he preached a sermon, and the sermon was like a fishing rod. Okay, now follow me. This is, I hope it's not too complicated. And this, this, see this line here? This is what you catch the fish on, right? And here's the little thing you catch the fi fish with. It's a hook. And there could be a worm, or there could be, this is called a royal coachman fly. And when the fish see that, they go after it, and then you reel them in. But you couldn't even get the worm or the royal coachman to the fish. If the fish is over there by that flagpole, there's no way you could get it there without this fishing rod, right? And not just the fishing rod, but see these little things that the line goes through? You know what those are called? Those are called guides. And when Jesus was preaching his Sermon on the Mount, he gave his followers guides. He told them, gave them things to do, ways to be, ways to behave. Can you remember anything that Jesus told us to do, to behave? What did he ask us to do, Chief? He asked us to be honest. What else did he ask us to do for hungry people? Well, he said, give to those in need, all right? And then he said, not just that, but he said, pray. You remember that? Did Jesus tell us to pray? He said, pray, but when you do it, do it in quiet, not to get anybody's attention, but just because you want to pray and you would like to talk to God. And then he said, here's another guide. See this little guide that the line goes through? He said, fast. You know what fasting is? That's going without food for like a day. And why would you do that? You would do that to remember all the people that you depend on to get food. The grocery store, your mom or dad who made the dinner, and God who helps grow the food. And, and he said, pray fast. He said, love others, but not just others, but even those who may not like you. Did, do you ever recall Jesus saying that? You know, maybe there's somebody that you're not getting along with, and Jesus said, love that person. Don't treat them, you know, in a negative way. Here's another guide. Here, see these guides? He said, ask for what you need. Ask God for what you need, and you just might get it. And he said, knock on the door of your faith. Knock on the door, and it will open. God will open that door. And he said, seek. Do you know what seek means? It means search. It means look for something. Seek for what? For the truth. Seek for the good. Seek to do what is right. And he said, don't worry. You don't have to worry. This is all in this Sermon on the Mount. He gave them all these guides. He said, don't worry, because God takes care of the birds, and do God takes care of the flowers, and if God takes care of those little creatures, God is going to take care of you even more. And he said, serve one master, not two. In other words, serve God, not just... Um, well... Let's see. Um, money, sometimes money gets to be really important and you save in your piggy bank and you get really focused on getting enough to buy something. Don't worry about that. Just remember that God is the one that you want to give your attention to. And then finally, Jesus said this. He said, small, all in this sermon, he said all these things in this Sermon on the Mount. He said, small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. So it's not easy to do these things, okay? 
And we don't always succeed. Sometimes we fail, I guess. Um, but the point is to keep trying. And so I was going to try to see if I can get the royal coachman over there. <laughs> Let's see. Um, the only way I'll be able to get this fly over there is, is with the guides, right? The guides. Guides for living, guides for fishing. Uh-oh. Do we have liability insurance here, Bob? <laughs> okay. All right, you know, that's, well, there it is. Yeah, that's all I'm going to do. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is very sharp. Thank you. Um, so remember the guides for living that ge Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. You need guides for fishing. You need guides for living. Let us pray. Oh, God, we thank you for Jesus, for the fact that he did like to fish for fish, but he also liked even more to fish for people. And he showed us just how to do that, first by living the way he wants us to live ourselves, and then maybe attracting other people to him. Amen. Thank you. You are wonderful listeners, or I was really boring. I've been one of the two. <laughs> Have a great day. Look at what a great crowd here this morning for the children's story. bow our heads for the prayer of illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, 
the bread of heaven. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today is Micah 6, chapter 6, 1 through 8, and the Pew Bible 8, 16. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you, and what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Baor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And we read responsibly, responsively, 469 in the Pew Bible. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Who do not slander with their tongue, and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors. Who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. seated. Gospel today is taken from the uh, Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, the Beatitudes, which are the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here in the readings, may God grant us understanding 
to these words of Scripture. Well, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here today, a great honor. Um, I experienced your ministry immediately as I turned in the driveway and saw this beautiful campus. I've seen it before, but haven't been here in some time, and it is pristine and so well kept and welcoming and is a statement not only about how the pride you take in this place of ministry, but in your community. What a wonderful way to enter Main Street Clarence. Uh, I, um, as Bob said, was uh, served at North Presbyterian Church many years ago, uh, and Bob gets tired of me saying this, but uh, his, I knew his father well, and uh, Roger Sillers, some of you I was chatting with this morning were here when Roger was pastor, and we had a little breakfast group that meet, met at uh, what was the Holiday Inn back in those days on Main Street in Williamsville, and Roger was our senior statesman, the, the one who had the wisdom that we turned to. There were about three of us who were fresh out of seminary, and Dave McFarland, my mentor, and uh, those, those were wonderful learning and fellowship uh, uh, and bonding times for me. And uh, Roger always had an array of, uh, he was like, you know, the, the nerd from the 70s with all those different colored pens. He had more writing instruments uh, and, and a different one every Wednesday. And, and so uh, we got him a Mont Blanc fountain pen when he retired. Uh, <laughs> Roger and Esther, such great uh, people and servants, and, uh, and their son, uh, following in his dad's footsteps in many ways today by his leadership here. Let us pray. Oh God, may your word be spoken, and may your word be heard. For Jesus' sake, amen. We live, many say, in a dystopian age, the latest consequence of climate change, Canadian forest fires that turn northeast skies into a perpetual orange sunset, intoxified the air we breathe, a war in Ukraine that compares with World War II with the added threat of the use of nuclear weapons, plus the spread of autocratic rulers and anti-democratic movements around the globe with a former U.S. president facing several trials for overreach and abuse of power. There are, of course, our personal concerns, from finances and a post-COVID economy that has inflated the cost of everything, to the persistent challenges of daily life, job satisfaction, raising children in a complicated world, and just trying to stay healthy. My wife, Carol, and I have learned recently of family members and friends diagnosed with dementia, leukemia, and heart disease. There is, too, the COVID-accelerated drop in participation in organized religion. So prevalent now it has its own name, de-churching. COVID shuttered most churches for in-person worship, and while live streaming made the church available at our convenience, the downside is that it prevented the rich in-person experience perennially reported as one of the main reasons people go to a particular church in the first place. I met with a dear friend the other day who is what used to be called a pillar of the church. He was lamenting his lack of enthusiasm for his duties serving as head of stewardship and recently asked to lead a new mission effort. He said he wasn't sure if it was COVID, getting out of the habit of regular church going, or just burnout. He added that he finds spiritual nourishment these days as often from podcasts and pundits writing about the meaning of life in today's topsy-turvy world as he does from the weekly sermon. It's true, there is a precipitous drop in organized religion. What is less obvious to surveys and polls is the erosion of congregational life and a shift in many churches from sustainability to the struggle to survive. 
The result is often to pull back finances and outreach for fear of running out of money or offending potential new members. Such reticence is often justified as prudent and responsible, but is really a disguise for fear. Shifting cultural norms and values and an insular church is not new. It is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about and the reason Jesus got into so much trouble. I want to talk today about the relevance of Jesus' famous sermon for our time. Clearly, he lived in a different age, but his era and ours share some uncanny parallels. Despite the secularizing of culture and the drop in church membership, the need for life-giving spirituality has not changed. Spiritual hunger across the land is deep. You can see it in the uptick of glossy ads for outrageously expensive luxury items. But a more accurate measure is the Surgeon General's report that cites an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. From 1990 to 2021, those who said they have five or more close friends dropped by 25%. Young adults report being lonelier than elderly Americans, regardless of our wealth and power as a nation, we seem to have lost what matters most, community and connection. Abraham Lincoln spoke to the spiritual malaise and anxiety of his time. In an age of irreconcilable division similar to ours, he said in his first inaugural address, Though passion may have strained, it must not break the bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, he went on, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone, all over this broad land, yet will swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. And yet Lincoln's era might have asked, where were those angels in a land at war with itself, causing more casualties than all succeeding wars combined? And we might ask, where are those angels today in a society that witnesses mass shooting after mass shooting and culture wars that have politicized everything from the books children read and high school drama productions to human sexuality? There is an increasing feeling these days of walking along a dangerous precipice in a nation divided over the legitimacy of the last presidential election, in an economy that defies the predictable indicators of risk, during what may be the last opportunity to avert climate catastrophe, and not least witnessing powerful challenges to a post-World War II world order based on international agreements to keep the question is, will we meet an uncertain future with courage and self-discipline as the call to worship proclaimed today? Many retreat into indifference and isolation or sentimentality and nostalgia or devil may care, live, eat, drink, and be merry for today. Or worse, some subscribe to conspiracy theories or bald-faced lies that provide easy, if absurd, reasons for the radical change and confusion taking place in our world. When Jesus took to the hills overlooking Lake Galilee, he was living at the emotional and spiritual center of a society and religion that was resisting inevitable change. The threat was not climate change, but the presence of an occupying superpower which would, a few decades after Jesus' execution, quash a Jewish uprising and cause a great diaspora after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. There was a palpable sense on the eve of that rebellion when Jesus preached his sermon that the world was about to end. The response by the religious authorities in Jesus' time was not unlike that of some churches today. 
rather than meet their despair and confront the harsh inequities of life under Roman rule with biblical faith, the Pharisees and Sadducees sought to consolidate and hold on to power, limited as it was. They reinforced interpretations of the scripture by adhering to rules and rituals that sacrificed the spirit for the letter of the law. In other words, they were playing it safe, not wanting to rattle or unsettle their tenuous relationship with the occupation government and risk losing their control over their religious base that constituted their realm of authority. In exchange, they abandoned justice, the justice of their tradition, which it stood for, and turned a blind eye to the abuse and oppression of their Roman rulers, not unlike some elected leaders today. Enter an itinerant rabbi from Nowheresville, Nazareth holder of no official status or degree, yet well-versed in the Hebrew Bible, and remarkably similar in his preaching and teaching to that long line of Hebrew prophets. In fact, Matthew presents him in today's text and throughout his gospel as the greatest leader and prophet of Israel, Moses. But this is the new Moses, who will give a new law and lead the people to a new land. Matthew is writing, remember, to the Jewish Christian community in Jerusalem. They are not the Gentile audience Luke writes to. They still keep their kosher kitchens and recall and rehearse many of the rituals and traditions of the faith in which they were raised. Today's lesson, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount that uh, continues, rather, for three chapters sounded for all the world to those first century Jewish Christians like Moses on Mount Sinai coming down with the tablets of law. Jesus proclaims a few verses after today's selection that he has come not to change but to fulfill the law. Indeed, his interpretation of the law breathes back into it the spirit that the Pharisees have taken away. This sermon left no one dozing on the hillside that day. At the very start, he holds up as exemplars of faith those who were the outliers and misfits. The Beatitudes lift up those thought to be the losers least likely to receive God's blessing. The ones pushed out of the way, poor in spirit, meek, those who mourn. The ones who stick to mercy when the law calls for an eye for an eye. The peacemakers and pure in heart that others saw as naive. And then he says those who are bullied because they stand by their faith. They speak truth to power and are rejected by religious and social authorities. Even they will be blessed. Welcome to the upside down world of the gospel. This man who already has a reputation for going against the grain, even working a miracle or two. Some think a spectacle, so they come to be entertained. But most of them heard he leaves you with a sense of hope. That just maybe their hard scrabble life, dead religion, and world ending fears may not be all there is. He tells them right off they have a mission. They are salt and light. They give zest and illumination to this brief human existence. Let your light shine, he says, so that others may see your good deeds and find their way home, even in this dark time. It's all part of something he calls the kingdom of God that has already arrived, if and when we live like those whom he blesses at the start of the sermon. But it isn't yet completely here because there is still so much work to do. Before he talks about those he will send them to minister to, he raises the bar on their own practice of faith. In the case of murder, adultery, divorce, lex talionis, the law of the land, even the treatment of enemies, he redefines what being a child of God is all about. More than going through the motions, checking the boxes of religious duty, 
It is living like you really trust the higher power he came to serve and calls his father. He teaches them to pray. He tells them not to worry. He urges them to fast, to remember their dependence on others, especially God, for sustenance and life. And when they pray and fast and give alms to the poor, not to do it while looking at themselves in the mirror of social standing or to get some reward, but to do it behind the scenes and take no credit. He says real treasure in this life does not glitter and shine, but is found when their hearts are focused on the kingdom of God. No one, not even Caesar or the IRS or death, can take that from them, ever. He says, don't judge others, for you are far from perfect. And it's not in your job description. But build your life, your spiritual home, on the values and goals of the kingdom, guides that you can always bet on, rather than the sand of social status that washes away when life gets hard. A.O. Scott commenting on the recent banning of books in several states, maybe you saw this a few weeks ago in the book review section of the Sunday New York Times. A.O. Scott says, great writing can entertain, enlighten, and even empower, but one of its greatest gifts is its ability to unsettle prodding us to search for our own moral in the story. And Franz Kafka wrote, a book must be the ax for the frozen sea inside us. You can say the same thing about the Sermon on the Mount in virtually every parable Jesus told and some of the tough love he doled out. Like the response to the man who said he wanted to follow Jesus, but first he had to bury his father a response scholars say is indisputably the word of Jesus, so opposed is it to all religious teaching. When Jesus told that man, let the dead bury their dead, you can almost hear the thwack of the ax against the ice of that man's frozen faith. We domesticate and ignore this great sermon and Jesus' parables and sayings at our peril. The only things that stand between us and the end of the planet as we know it, including tens of thousands of plant and animal life forms and human life itself, are our courage, self-discipline, and faith in a way of living that for 2,000 years we've been trying to get right and lately many have given up on. Two final points and a takeaway. Point one, our eight-year-old granddaughter and her parents from Connecticut were just with us for a long and wonderful Fourth of July weekend. We saw the original Huckleberry Finn manuscript at the Erie County Library, visited the new AKG Buffalo Art Gallery after downing grilled cheese sandwiches at the museum's cafe prepared a big breakfast for the whole family with her playing waitress and head chef and I as her assistant and listening to her grandmother play clarinet with the Erie County Wind Ensemble at Bassett Park in Williamsville on July 4th. Priceless moments. Point two. They say the atmosphere that surrounds the earth is the equivalent of a coat of blue paint that separates us from the endless, cold, sterile abyss of space beyond. It gives one pause to consider the contrast of this tiny speck of life in an out-of-the-way solar system with the rest of the vast void of life universe. It's almost like it was meant to be, intended, and caused by some creative, benevolent energy beyond our imagination. Here's the takeaway. Not only are the reasons to preserve and keep this place and all of its inhabitants a sacred duty, but we are equipped with every means to do so, 
with brains that are the most remarkable and complex entities in the universe, in hearts shaped in the very image of God, which is to say that we inherently know right from wrong. Isn't it time to step back in this gift of a summer and consider the world's children and their future and then embrace for all we are worth the words of Jesus and the life he calls us to. If you sense a thin layer of frost around the edges of your prayer life, or your calling to be better than yourself in some challenging circumstance of the moment, remember the awesome weight of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It can break through any barrier between you and the love and forgiveness of God. Today is all we have. The present moment is everything. We dare not let it slip away. If you are able, will you please rise for hymn number 707, Take Thou Our Minds, Dear Lord. of 1967. We believe that God has created the world of space and time to be the sphere of his dealings with humankind. 
in its beauty and vastness, sublimity and awfulness, order and disorder, the world reflects to the eye of faith the majesty and mystery of its creator. We believe that God has created us for a personal relationship in which we may respond to the love of the creator. Life is a gift to be received with gratitude and a task to be pursued with courage. Please be seated. Let us pray. O light of the world, shine upon us. We have sought for a light that never fades, for a glory that is never dimmed. And we have found that the things which people often rejoice in, the world's fame and power and riches, bring no glory that endures. And so we come back to the things we have neglected, to the common tasks, the stern commands of conscience, the sacrifice of love. And we turn again to the man from Nazareth, even Jesus, listening to the stories he told, pondering his deeds, contemplating the cross, the appearances to the disciples, and the mighty rushing of Pentecost spirit upon the multitudes. Help us, O sovereign of the ages, in these changing times and troubled days. Lose not sight of us when we lose sight of thee. Hold us fast when we cannot imagine what we can or should hold on to. If our focus becomes blurred and our sense of call becomes dim, Grant us in ways only thou canst design to somehow fulfill thy will. Help us to act even when we are not sure. Help us to trust even when we cannot believe. Help us to hope even when we cannot imagine why. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for all who work with hand or brain in city or in the fields for those who leave home each day and for those who cannot leave home or chair or bed, for those who supervise and for those who must take orders, for those whose work is dangerous or monotonous or mean, for those who can find no work to do, for those who are called to the service of the poor, or the healing of the sick, and for all who see their work as the proclamation of the gospel. We praise, uh, pray this day for those whose names are listed in this morning's <coughs> bulletin. And also remember Janet Mustard, in whose memory the Christ candle is lighted today, and David Folger and his parents, in whose memory the flowers are given. And we ask your blessing and protection upon those Algonquin canoers who left early this morning for a week of delight and enjoyment and exercise in the beauty of creation. And we thank you, O oh God, for the anticipation in this congregation of the coming of new leadership and pastoral care. We ask your blessing upon Greg and Kathleen as they uh, embark upon their retirement and a new chapter of life. And we now offer to you the special concerns in our hearts. Hear them, we pray. We join our prayers with that global community of your people, O oh God, gathered this day in great cathedrals or humble dwellings, who are alone and dream of those they love or who are surrounded by vast throngs, who are new to the faith 
and overwhelmed by it or who have become carelessly familiar with the great good news of thy love. With our brothers and sisters in every nation, we join in praising your name and making these prayers in Jesus' name and now praying as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said it is better to give than receive, and so in that spirit of giving, let us continue our worship.
those in despair, may they bring hope. For those who are broken, may they bring healing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Final hymn is number 307, God of Grace and Glory, 307. center for music in the brain like there is for speech or motor skills. It activates the entire brain, and you all did that today. Just beautiful. So let us go today with grace, with wisdom, with courage, with self-discipline, living with those guides of life that Jesus shared with us in that great Sermon on the Mount, not always managing to do it perfectly, sometimes to do it well and faithfully with each other, encouraging each other, strengthening the faith and resolve of one another to make this world the kind of place in which our children can grow to full stature and wisdom themselves. May God bless you and keep you. May God lift up the light of God's face upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Thank you.